Welcome to the YB Min Lecture Series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the International Communications Foundation in Seoul, Korea. I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. My name is Danny Lee. Uh, I'm a double alum. I grew up in Culver City, so I'm homegrown. And uh, Roberto knows uh, at nine years old, I wanted to, uh, looked up the hill and I wanted to go to Loyola because as you see this big LMU on the hill. So ever since then, I, I've uh, fallen really in love with the school, the education, the environment, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I've participated in many roles to support the campus and the university and the community here. And I, I really hope you guys are enjoying your time here. It's, uh, it was very special for me uh, as a learning experience and a development experience. So, um, <clears throat> About my background, uh, I started out uh, in uh, Big Four Consulting. I started out actually before then it was uh, Big Eight with a company called Arthur Anderson. And I started there uh, as a uh, computer security uh, consultant. So I grew up as a hacker and I went into the company to, to help look at computer systems that run our banking systems, that run our ATM, that run our phone bills, electricity, water, all of those things are all computerized. And uh, that's, that's how I got started. And then from Anderson, I went to KPMG. I've been with KPMG for over 22 years now. So it's been a while with uh, KPMG. And uh, during, along that route, uh, they gave me an opportunity to go abroad. Um, they allowed, they uh, suggested I look at maybe some countries in Asia because I was doing very well in the States already um, and they needed uh, someone that had a lot of energy and uh, someone that was Asian because we were trying to grow our Asian practice. So I, I chose China uh, because at the time it wasn't really that big yet. It was, uh, I started looking in 2003. And um, you know, I was thinking around Korea, Japan, Vietnam. That's where I'm originally from. My parents are, uh, but I chose China. And when I landed in China, KPMG uh, had uh, I think 5,000 employees, uh, eight different offices around China, uh, and 50 consultants, five zero. So 50 people that were helping companies solve problems. Um, I was the first partner to land, and um, 10 years later, my dad suggested I come back home. So I came back here, and I left behind me 1,000 consultants. So that business went from 50 to 1,000 in 10 years. And during those 10 years, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of things about how to start a business, because in fact, that's what I was doing, starting a a business of selling advice to an economy that was growing rapidly. Uh, and that's a very, very difficult thing to do because it's an intangible that you're selling. So you really have to understand how a market develops and how to demonstrate value for the advice that you have. So many of you here uh, you know, are studying business, MBA programs, and so forth. You'll come across that, uh, that issue, that challenge for all of us here. So um, in any case, uh, I got to experience that explosion uh, uh, of, of a lifetime, really. There will never be an economy that's the size of China to kind of grow all at once in that kind of a rate ever again. Right? India is not the same thing. The ASEAN countries are not the same thing. China is very specific and very peculiar, and particular, in its history, its composition, that's got it to where it is today. So um, I'll go through some basic stats and then eventually kind of end up you know, uh, with two, two, two slides that are quite important. One is, what do you do as an expat living in China, as a professional living in China, as an executive, as a management person going into a foreign country? How do you do business? And two, what does a company do when they go to China? So it's two different things. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll also you know, color commentary as, as we go along here. But 
So <clears throat> shifting global landscape. So you, 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 you notice here, uh, we always think about America as being terrific and great. And you look at that rate of growth that America had, where's the, um, the blue line here? You know, in comparison to the rest of the world, we really had a steep curve. Country around arguably 300 years old, came out of nowhere <clears throat> and just shot up. <clears throat> but now when you look at the China curve, that red curve, that's uh, breakneck speed. That is really steep. It, that is like going vertical, right? So you gotta think about what that means for all the people that's in that country, all that rapid movement. I would sit there and work with people and <clears throat> go and recruit staff to come into our firm. And these staff, they, when I was there in 2005, they were probably making four or $500 a month as a salary, as a starting salary. But their parents were making one-tenth that. And their parents' parents was even less than that. And now, as I left, everybody was starting at around $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year salary. That's still relatively small compared to the US, but you could see that every 10 years, they basically multiplied their income by 10. So if your style of spending is X, and then suddenly your child gets 10X, their style of spending changes too. So the value system changes very quickly in behaviors and how people place value on things. So it's very, very peculiar, very interesting to see how fashion's taking place, how much spending and consumption's actually being accelerated by the younger uh, generation that doesn't carry that burden of, you know, seeing how hard it was to, to generate $10 before. Now it's very easy to generate 10,000. So rapid uh, GDP growth rate, everybody's being much more productive uh, and it is much greater than the U.S. speed. Um, closing the gap between uh, urban and uh, rural and urban areas, this is actually also very important characteristics. Um, at one point, something like 20% of China was urban, the rest was rural. That meant they were all um, potentially farmers, hard labor, manufacturing in outside cities. So they didn't have a lot of um, interaction, communication, not a lot of exposure to fashion, not a lot of exposure to different people. So culturally, the, the ability to exchange thoughts and ideas was not as great. But as the society start to have more urbanization, then people get to see each other more, that rate of learning and exchange becomes much greater. So what you'll see in China is the population there is thirsty for knowledge. These, they, will, they will study, they will capture new trends, and they will innovate very rapidly. They learn very quickly. Um, one of the things that we did uh, in, in China, uh, KPMG, we, we helped China's various cities come up with strategies for urbanization also. So urbanization is bringing up the productivity of a person because a person working in a uh, manufacturing scenario is going to frankly produce less than someone who's working in an office, uh, services industry or financial services industry, that, that type of uh, uh, an industry. So they want to shift that labor to something that's more productive and traditionally that's in an urban environment. Um, the more cities they produce, the greater the growth, the greater the GDP is going to grow for China. So they have to come up with different types of cities. So cities started to come up with strategies. You'd have a, a um, governor of a particular region decide that we're going to be the health city. So they would package up an idea around health care. And they would make that city the destination for health care. Someone else would want, let's say, technology chem, uh, chemicals, pharma. So all of these different industry segments become these trends that uh, uh, cities try to coalesce around to brand themselves and distinguish themselves as an area for investment, for growth. Right? So we'll see a lot of that. Now, you can see some of the star uh, starking numbers here. 14 cities 
with more than 10 million people. That's, uh, that's a lot of people. Uh, 62, 62, 82 cities with over 3 million people, right? So just, just a lot and a lot of these big cities. And when you look at something like uh, Australia, was that uh, 40 million people at best? You know, the whole, the whole of Australia? Uh, so, you know, countries start to take a different size and, and shape in terms of their productivity and what it means for China. So here's, here's how you can also look at it. Beijing, the city of Beijing, that's a, the economy the size of Denmark. Right? Uh, in the Guangdong uh, area of China, which is southern China, uh, that is the, the greatest amount of wealth in China. Uh, that's where all the manufacturing, so you, you've heard the, the saying that 80% uh, of the world's manufacturing is done in China, it's, it's there. And that's why it's, it's also one of the most wealthy places in China. You can see there, for example, uh, Shanghai over here is uh, the economy of Colombia, this one city. It's very, very interesting how you can fit almost the whole world on there, right? Uh, so what this urbanization does, actually, does bring up, in fact, uh, greater GDP growth, uh, greater maturity, and it shifts the, the, the position of China in the world. And when you look at, you know, who are the top 50 cities in the world, you'll see there's been some really major shift and changes in where these cities, uh, where, where, where these cities are. So all these cities here have been downgraded. And those are the ones that are being upgraded. So we're switching uh, Detroit, Denver, Munich, Melbourne. Those guys fall off the top 50. And we're putting up there Shenyang, Shenzhen, Wuhan, Xi'an. Xi'an's where the uh, terracotta soldiers are. Right? So those cities are coming up to be top 50 cities in the world in productivity. So as a student, you'd think there's a lot of opportunities there, right? As an investor, you'd think maybe I should go over there to build my markets. I'd have to expand my business to those cities. Maybe I need a headquarter or a, a big branch that I need to set up there, right? Um, and the Fortune 500 companies are also shifting. So we just talked about how the GDP and the urbanization changes and the top cities, that drives investment. And ultimately here, you'll see the Fortune 500s also have that impact. They're also moving. So it used to be uh, all over on this side of the world, Europe and mostly America. Now you see the purple. Those are the ones that are coming in uh, to the Fortune 500s. Big, big shift in, in landscape for economies. As you change the rural to urban, as we spoke earlier, um, spending behaviors change. People are in cosmopolitan cities. They spend more. They buy more. And that's how the economy starts to grow even faster. Right? And you see the middle class in China now is well over, if you include the affluent it's almost 60%, right? People that have income, disposable income. And that number is much larger than two times the US economy, I mean the US population in whole. So that market of people who can buy are much larger than the population of America altogether, many folds. So meat consumption's up. Uh, this is another indicator that we use when we look at macroeconomics in terms of uh, you know, urbanization. So you're eating more, more meat, meaning you are having a, a better lifestyle, more affluent lifestyle. And actually, chicken, pork uh, are uh, deficits for China. They have to buy from abroad because they consume too much. Uh, I've worked with many companies that are going into China trying to uh, bring uh, products into China, such as uh, pork, chicken, beef, and so forth, into China. And they struggle. They struggle a lot because, um, one, the market there is, is of high demand and it's very competitive. And two, actually, surprisingly, the uh, quality of production continues to move very rapidly upward. 
So you've heard of the food scares that they've had in the past. The Chinese government has reacted very strongly to that. And now there's a lot of regulation in place. And in some instances, local uh, chicken hatcheries are actually much cleaner than the foreign ones. Right, so it's, it's very interesting uh, in that sense of, of how fast things move there. Okay, so, um, so that's the backdrop in the economics of China. And uh, what I wanted you to get out of that is a very rapid movement of growth, a very rapid change in behaviors and style of living. Uh, I would say that you know, I, I've traveled at least uh, three quarters of this planet. Uh, and uh, by far, China is uh, one of the most cosmopolitan places I've ever been. Uh, I've lived here, I grew up here in LA, and I've uh, been uh, shot at, uh, pointed guns at, but in China for 10 years, not one peep. It was the safest place I've ever been. Very, very safe. All throughout China. It's incredibly how safe it is. And the reasons why is, uh, I guess the enforcement is pretty, pretty strong, pretty severe, right? So it, there's a strong deterrent in that way. But, uh, you know, we, we would go there, and the typical thing is you'd see kids uh, on college campuses getting drunk in the evening, maybe having a fight. Uh, not, not in China. You'd, they'd all just disperse. You'd all get ushered away, and it was gone. So it's actually very interesting, the, the amount of safety that's there, too. Um, before I, I get into this, a uh, couple of things I also wanted to highlight. Um, if you look at China, the, 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 the map of China is actually the same size landmass as the United States. Right? Uh, however, the U.S. is arable land is actually plentiful. And in China, only one-fifth of that land is arable. So the rest of that is desert, rocks. Right? You can't really grow anything on it. So right there, geographically, they're one-fifth disadvantaged from the US. Two, they have five times the population of people. That's another disadvantage. Three, they're boxed in by unfriendly neighbors to the north, to the west, the south, as well as to the west, uh, uh, east, right? So if you look at the map itself, you'll see China's uh, western borders are actually blocked from Korea all the way down into Vietnam because you've got Japan, you've got the Philippines, all these countries that are very, very US friendly. And you need that, that waterway to actually transport and export, import, export, right? You can't get anything in and out. So China is actually in a very severe situation when you look at it geographically, demographically. And uh, an economist shared with me that based on that premise, and you compare it to the US, you know, one-fifth the amount of people, friendly on all sides. You got huge oceans on both sides of America that you can ship things in and out very easily. You got the Mississippi coming through it, feeding the whole of the country. The Yangtze for China is really not that great not the same amount of strength as, as the Mississippi is for, for, for the US. So geographically and demographically speaking, China is doomed to fail. And the US is destined to succeed. So th these are the conditions that the government finds themselves into. Right? And you have to think about that. They're fighting very, very hard. We don't really have to fight much because we wake up in the morning and it's, it's pretty easy. It's friendly all over. So this is the mentality that the Chinese government and the Chinese businesses and the Chinese people have embedded in their culture. They fight very hard. They are very protectionist. They are looking to kind of this boundary of where China is. They're very sensitive to that. And that's why now you have issues with the South China Sea, which is that pushing of the border outward. Another very important part of uh, Chinese business is this thing called the five-year uh, five plan. So they do these five-year plans all the time. And this is the 13th five-year plan now. And basically, it's the state, the country's government, deciding how we're going to develop our country. 
And the government gets very involved with the economy, with the business. So for example, in the US, Google is a public company. But in China, Tencent is also a public company, sort of. There's parts of it as public, parts of it are government controlled. Why is that? Because the Chinese government believe that if they can influence the economy and control it, they can control growth. They can avoid the disruption of unnecessary competition and collision within their own economy and accelerate themselves forward. Right? So if you have five, six different companies competing with each other all the time, in our, in our mentality, that's free market, that's terrific. You, you will come away with the strongest uh, 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 company. But in China, they may not have time to wait for that. And they're able to choose their winners a little bit earlier. And they will shape the economy to make sure that that happens. So what you'll see, for example, when I first got there, uh, landlines for telephone was owned by one company. Wireless telephones, mobile phones, was owned by another company. And yet, internet service was yet owned by another company. So they had three major telco providers, uh, China Unicom, um, China Mobile, and China Telecom. And each one of these started off in their respective provinces providing telco services. But the government said, you know what? We want all you guys to stop doing what you're doing. We want all these guys to group together and become landline providers. These guys to do mobile phones. And these guys over here, you guys go do uh, internet service provision. And split up all your businesses into those configurations. So they automatically decided how they were going to drive the telecom industry. And the telco companies had to comply because management came from the party. Right? So in, in the companies in China, uh, we, here we have, a, uh, we have a department called HR. Right? So you have a company, then you have HR, and you have your business uh, unit heads who review the employees in that business unit and decide their level of performance. So you have performance management process. HR oversees that. You promote people accordingly. In China, they have some of that. But then they also have a, a party department in many of the major companies. And that department is the department that looks at the state agenda as it applies to this company. How is it being executed by management? So if you're a telco provider and you're providing landlines, and it costs a lot of money to put fiber optics down into the farmlands to get somebody internet access out in the middle of nowhere. So you're thinking, no, I don't want to do that. Let the, let the mo mobile guy do that. But if the state agenda is you must provide landline access to everyone, they'll do it even if they're losing money. Because that's the state agenda. And the state agenda may be hidden in there that they want greater employment, that they want to use all the excess technology that they have for landline technology. Maybe their production of fiber optics cables was, you know, uh, uh, they had surplus the year before and they wanted to use it, so they'll force the company to use it to roll it out. So there, it's, it's integrated in that sense of the agenda of the state as delivered to the, to the commercial side of the economy are mandates for management to execute. And within the company, there is a department that's overseeing whether or not management is complying and carrying out those, those uh, mandates. Right? That's very, very important to, to know about a Chinese company, too. So anyways, um, here is the five-year plan, the latest one. So really to uh, focus on a prosperous society. So this is something new. Uh, prosperous is a, is a very uh, typically un-Chinese word in the old days. It is now a much more commonly used word because everyone can be prosperous. Right? Uh, society, they're really looking at the social aspect now. And embedded in this is all the mechanisms that will control a society. So every one of these words that they're using you have to kind of start to think how each of those sectors will be impacted. 
So you know when they use the word society, the internet is going to be affected because society is very much impacted by internet access. Right? As well as travel, travel is going to be impacted. Right? So there's several different factors as when you look at the five-year goal, you start to interpret how it fits into the economy, which part of the economy participates. So escaping the middle income trap, comprehensively deepening China's reform. Right? So really they believe that the reforms that they have put in place in years prior have not been fully adopted. That's why they want to deepen it. And comprehensively, meaning they want to spread it out all industries. So um, some of the specifics un underlying that include innovation. So China is very much fostering innovation. Uh, different types of green development. They know that a sustainable economy must begin now. Sustainable energy, clean energy, all of those things need to be uh, worked on. And then continuing to open up the Chinese industries. Right? So in the past, what you'll see is the five-year plan will talk about investments in technology. And suddenly, you know, everything's all around technology. Uh, there was a time when it's all about manufacturing. So excellence in manufacturing. So they talked about how they could acquire technologies and techniques from, say, Japanese automakers so they can produce cars more effectively and more efficiently. Right? Um, so these are the various agendas that the state will have. And every company, KPMG, IBM, Microsoft, every company spends a ton of time just studying this five-year plan and interpreting it. Right? Because that, this, is, this is your go-to-market strategy. This is your investment strategy. This is your tax strategy. This is your HR strategy, all embedded in it. Um, but in recent times, there's been a, a bit of a slowdown in the economy. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, it's just really the law of size, right? After a while, you, you just can't keep that steep curve all the time. And I think there is some, there's a lot of discussion out in the public now about whether or not China's hit its peak. It's basically puttering out. It's slowing down. Uh, there is no more. Uh, uh, growth that's to be had there. Um, I think China calls it the new normal. Right? Uh, if you look at the economy of China, uh, at one point, given the rate of development and where they were in the maturity vis-a-vis -vis first world countries, uh, you would say that China had to have a GDP growth of at, at least 4 to 5% just to be even. Because it's just natural growth that's going on in the maturity of, of a country. So it, we only looked at the numbers above that. So if we look at China, let's say China is still in a mature maturation process, and that maturation process means a baseline of, let's say, 3%, it's still doing better than 3% of growth year on year, which is pretty, pretty, pretty powerful for the second largest uh, economy in the world. So uh, I would say that uh, you could also argue whether or not China really is the second largest economy of the world, or is it the first? So in the US, our economy is pretty transparent. In China, the economy is not transparent. There are uh, gray parts of the economy. Uh, there's shadow banking. I'm sure those of you who've looked into financial uh, industries in China, you'll hear about that. Shadow banking is alternative banking mechanisms for loans, for financial movement uh, within the economy. Some of that is done through banks. Some of that is done outside of banks. And uh, it's not registered within the economy the same way. So there are lots of different uh, um, alternative parts of the economy that's not captured in our traditional model that is still functioning very powerfully. So. Um, I think uh, they said something like uh, over $30 billion in you know, the um, uh, great uh, uh, shadow banking environment. So that's, that's a lot of money moving around. Right? Um, so if you look at the economy uh, today, you could say the US around 15 trillion, China around 11, 12 trillion. Uh, if you had 
20% of the economy that's not transparent in China, you'd overtake the 15 trillion in the US already. Right? So there's, there's, there's arguments there that China is actually much larger than we think it is. And uh, we, we need to really uh, pay attention to the movement in that economy because there's a rever reverberating effects to us. Right? Uh, Two-track economy, the other aspect of China. Uh, the manufacturing side is slowing down. The technology side is ramping up. Ramping up very quickly. So we here know about Uber and Lyft. In China, there's about 100 of those companies. There's startups all over the place. And they're called a whole number of names. And they do a number of services. So here, for the most part, the issue is really uh, your um, putting out, you're, you're requesting a car, you're requesting, and, and basically uh, people nearby uh, who are signed up to Uber will either volunteer or accept your request, right? So you're bidding out your trip. I want to go from LMU to you, I don't know, um, Beverly Hills, right? That's my trip. I'm putting it out there. Everybody bids for it, and the guy that's closest gets it, right? But in China, you can do that on a price basis. People will bid, actually, for a lower price. And there's a reverse that happens. Instead of me telling you where I want to go, it's about the car. So the car tells me, hey, I've got a Tesla, and I can pick you up in five minutes. Or wait, 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 I've got a Mercedes, and I can pick you up in eight minutes. And over there, I've got a Toyota, I can pick you up in 10 minutes, but I'm going to charge you half the price. These are the types of apps they have for car sharing, car services. So the, the market is very dynamic. These things we don't think about, and yet the technology over there is growing very rapidly. The other thing about the two-track economy, which I think you know, all of us should really keep in mind is, China is very unique in the sense I think it's kind of space and time all at once, in the sense that you have a rapidly maturing economy. So you have people that are in poverty, and you have people that are extremely wealthy all at once. You have markets that are very immature, and you have markets that are highly mature, moving very, very fast, like I said earlier, car, car sharing services. Right? So as someone coming into the economy, you need to be very careful about where you're going into China, specifically geographically, and what you're trying to achieve. Because there are so many layers, so many stratosphere throughout China. It is not one country. It is, one, it is not one market. It is many markets at once growing through time. And so you need to choose where you want to be for what purpose. And what's very interesting is many of my clients, now that I come back here in the States, they take the concept of innovation and instead of innovating here, they innovate in China. Right? Why? Because there in China, you have microcosms in places that you can test out different ideas all at once. And you can determine whether or not this product is going to do well in a, in a slow market, in a fast market, what type of market is it going to do best in. And you can test that theory out at once in many, many different markets at once. So the two-track economy, I think, is a very interesting one because initially at surface level, you look at an economy going down or a traditional economy that's very heavy industries, heavy uh, lifting, uh, you know, manufacturing base, uh, labor intensive. Um, that, that, that industry is declining. The tech industry, very fast, rapid, that industry is growing. But it's all happening together at once in the same economy in the same country, in the same city. Well, we had things happen in Syria, pretty much. Right? Innovation and entrepreneurship, huge, huge in China. Uh, you can set up a store. There are tons of internet stores in China. And there is a website, which I wish they had it here. It's called Taobao. It's the greatest e-commerce site you've ever seen. I mean, you go on this thing, and if you want a pen, you want a pin, 
you could buy a pin in a thousand different ways, and they'll deliver the one pin to you, right? So the amount of products that are on Taobao and the, the pace at which they send things to you is incredible. I was there, I, um, so I was in the office, I was gonna go out to dinner with uh, my clients, and one of my uh, friends came in, my colleagues came in and said, hey, Danny, look at this, this is a great new camera, uh, it just came out, uh, you can get it for really cheap right now if you buy it, I just got one. I said, really? Okay. So I got online, and they said, okay, where do you want it delivered? So said, well, tomorrow here? No, 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 they'll deliver it to you in three hours. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm in the office. I got to go to dinner with a client. Tell them where you're going to be at dinner. So I punched in the address where I am having dinner. And while I'm having dinner, my phone text messaged. I walked outside, handed the guy cash, picked up my box, walked back in. Delivered to me at the restaurant. Literally, some guy on a, motor, uh, on a, on a bicycle in the middle of the night just got up to the restaurant and delivered me a brand new camera for 600 bucks. That's really fast. It's pretty amazing. So lots of uh, innovation, lots of uh, entrepreneurism. Uh, really, this is the market to watch because of those dynamic aspects of everything happening at once. You can, you can take an immature model and try to make it mature in China. You can accelerate that growth. It's a lab experiment, right? Um, the infrastructure is actually pretty immense there. Um, this one here is really to show you uh, the type of investments that uh, China's got in infrastructure. So the number of uh, trains that are in China, as you can see represented in the graphic here, is uh, more than the rest of those other countries below it <laughs> combined. Right? So lots of infrastructure investments. These are all high speed, very, very fast trains. Right. Um, direct foreign investments, um, direct foreign investments continue to grow in China. People still bring a lot of money into China. Um, you can see there, 2015, $126 billion in direct foreign investment. That's a lot of money. Now let me flip this around. Last year, China invested over $33 billion in the U.S. And that's the rest of the world going into China. China going into the U.S. alone was $33 billion. So when you talk about trade, you have to also look at it both ways. That China is actually coming to us, too, in a big way. They've invested over $30 billion in New York. $15 billion in California. They love the top four uh, um, destinations in the U.S. is New York, uh, California, Texas, and Virginia. And it still comes. I mean, uh, 2005, there was $1 billion. Now, last year, over 33. This year, already past $25 billion, and it's not the end of the year yet on the way to breaking that number. All right, so what are some of the investments? Legendary, you know the guys that make the movie, the studios, right? Well, it's bought by Wanda, Wanda Studios. Uh, uh, Wanda Global, I guess they call themselves. Uh, Wanda is one of the largest uh, companies in China. Uh, it started out with real estate, shopping malls. He owns a chain of karaoke's. And then he came over here and he bought up AMC. So AMC is actually Chinese. And they brought up, bought up uh, uh, Legendary Studios, right? And um, he also put out a billion dollars to build brand new studios in Qingdao for movie production. So there's these companies in China are now getting to a point where they're reaching critical mass and they want to go out and buy assets also. China uh, is responsible for over almost 100, 100 uh, I want to say more than 100,000 jobs in the US. Um, I forget the exact numbers, but there's some, there's the, the, even the jobs in the US have grown because of the Chinese. 
All right, so $33 billion in China, it's a, it's a big one. And you, you can see right down the street here, there's a company called Faraday Futures. So Faraday Futures is uh, trying to become another Tesla. Right? So it's a brand new company, started from scratch, selling electric vehicles, um, and they want to beat Tesla. And they don't want to just sell you a car, they want to sell you a subscription to a car. So when you buy a car, the, the car will be autonomously delivered to you. So I'm uh, on a weekend, I'm going out with my wife, I need a two-seater sporty car, they'll send a sports car over. And I drive that around, ride that around. And then Sunday when I wake up and I take the family out for a brunch, a four-seater comes in. And next week I need to go pick up some stuff at Lowe's, a seven-seater pops up, or an SUV pops up, over, right? So they're thinking different on, on cars. They're thinking about selling you a platform for mobility. So there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of investments both ways, but I, I thought that, that you know, it'd be good for you to, to recognize that, that two, two, uh, two views. So I'm just gonna go very quickly here. Um, there are problems. Uh, pollution in China is very, very big deal. Um, this is actually um, a little bit darker than real, but pretty close to the real thing. Right. So I, uh, I'm, I'm a cyclist. I like to uh, ride my bike on the weekend. And uh, when I first got there, uh, one of the th things that I used to really enjoy doing is riding my bike along the Great Wall. So I live in Beijing, very close to the Great Wall. You ride out on your bike for about 30 minutes, and you can see the Great Wall, and you ride in the, the villages, and you can see this great you know, monument, right? the historical monument. Um, you can't ride anymore because literally when you get out there, it's just it's like a fog. Right? There are days that it, it clears up, but it's pretty bad. Quickly go into doing business in China um, for Companies versus um, executives. You have to have long-term commitment. Uh, China is not going to let you come in and build a business, make money in five years, and then you know repatriate that that profit. China wants you to go in there, make money, create employment, and become a Chinese company. So grow in China, stay in China. They're going to do everything that they can to do that. So if you're a technology company, you're bringing tech over, eventually they're gonna ask you to localize your tech, right? Um, think global and go local, that's really the thing. You might have global ambitions, but you need to be invested in China. If you're gonna go to business in China, you gotta stay in China, can't really leave. Flexibility and agility, and you have to be flexible to deal with the government. Because the sectors, if you're making a lot of money, the government and the policies will shape and rebalance in favor of national companies. Right? These, are, these are just facts. So for example, I, I tell my clients, hire local national management. You can bring expats over, teach them how to do business, but very quickly try to local, uh, hire somebody local and teach them your core values and bring them into the company and make them a part of your company for good. Because, for example, if you have a CFO that's local Chinese, when the regulators come to talk to you about taxation and all that, it's a much easier conversation. Meaning, you might get relief for some of those payments. Right? They'll allow you to maybe negotiate your taxes lower. But if you don't have someone that has that understanding culturally and has the interest and the commitment for the local market, you might not be able to succeed in some of these negotiations. So it's, it's very important. Um, indoctrinate local management. Um, you also have to be able to innovate and be willing to disrupt because um, the business that you do in the US, the, the products that you make in Denmark or wherever it is, won't work in China. The population is different, the, the market's different, so you need to be prepared to make some changes. 
Many of the auto manufacturers of the world are now introducing new models in China. They're designing in China. So if one of the things that uh, uh, was very uh, interesting, in the US, if you look at, uh, say, Mercedes or BMW, right, you have your 3 Series, your 5 Series, and your 7 Series. So it's basically small, medium, large, if you will, right? So in China, they don't, they don't really do that. They have 3, 5, and 7s, but they have like S, class, uh, S Series, or basically an extended platform. So they'll take a, an Audi A4 or BMW 3 Series, but they make it a little longer and suddenly it sells better, right? You don't have those platforms here in the US. They sell very, very well in China, right? So these compact cars that we see, they're extended in China, and yet they, they sell a lot better. In China, they don't really care about whether the engine is 5.0, 8.0, 3,000 horsepower. They really want to have the stature of the car, the size of the car to look more stately. That's what they're concerned about. They're not concerned about going faster. And then uh, for executives living in China, I think one of the things you need to do is really embrace the culture of China and understand the, the mentality of management, what they're trying to do. And one of the th sayings that I, I learned very early on, as an expat going to China, I wake up in the morning, yeah, 1.4 billion people to sell to. This is going to be a great day. But the Chinese don't think that. They wake up and say, Oh, holy cow, 1.4 billion people to compete against. So you have to understand that, right? So if you wake up in the morning and you're ready to compete versus you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, you know, it's going to be a big, easy day. You're already losing out on that competition. You have to come into China prepared to compete, and you have to compete really at a high level. Everybody's got their game on. Uh, you got to read up. Uh, I think traveling across China is very important. I've traveled over 30 different cities in China. Uh, I love that place. Uh, I've seen you know, so many different types of cities, different types of people, landscape. Um, once you see that, you realize when you're interacting with the Chinese, where they come from uh, is, is really a big part of their, their psyche. And, um, how they behave, what they think, uh, as well as when you're uh, in negotiation, when you're dealing with business partners, you kind of appreciate that other dimension. So it's very important. Um, one thing to never do in, in China as a businessman is we never say, back at home we do this, or in the US we do this, or, in France we do this. You never start a sentence that way because that's very condescending for them, and it's, uh, it shows that we're not open-minded enough to understand why, why China first, right? So that's very important. And uh, that's it. That's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the things that you need to do as an executive. So I'll just pause there and open up for Q&A or any questions. When you're doing business, regulatory uh, pressures are, really matter. Uh, and again, I just can't impress upon you how different it is to do business here versus in, 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 in China. Here, you're just dealing with regulators as, as a checklist. And only when you're in a s particular industry like financial services, banking in particular, insurance, that you have all these regulations that, you know, if you get a loan, you got to be notified of that loan. The buyer has to approve all these types of things that, that uh, Come along with it. But uh, in, in China, um, there are a lot of regulations, and regulations in China work very differently. Regulations in China, uh, for the most part, are structural in nature. In, a, in other words, they prevent a whole sector of business from even starting. So, for example, uh, in energy, certain companies can't, foreign companies can't do business in certain parts of the energy sector. Rare metals, if you want to go into China to mine or sell rare metals, you can't do it. Only local companies, right? Uh, if you want to uh, manufacture something, like a car, well, there is a regulation. You have to do a joint venture. You can't set up your own company. 
Right? So there are structural uh, uh, regulations that are applied across multiple industries, multiple situations. After that, the regulation becomes guidance. So they'll have regulatory guidance on if you're in a banking sector, uh, you should have, for example, all of the data generated in China must remain in China and cannot be offshored. Right? So now if you have a, uh, uh, an offshore uh, uh, outsourcing kind of environment, it becomes difficult. So let's say you're a bank. A bank has a lot of technology behind that that's calculating your accounts, your interests, and all that stuff. And if you just started a small bank, you don't have the kind of money to buy that kind of system and leave it in China. You'd have to outsource it, maybe use it in Japan or somewhere else. So it's cost prohibitive, but the regulation says you've got to have it there. Right? Um, but the other side of that is enforcement. So enforcement, they're having some difficulties with enforcement because it's very hard to enforce regulations. So you'll see what happens is they'll have uh, regulations that are applied by industry that structurally prevent certain things from happening, and then they have uh, regulations that are guiding principles. And some of those operational level uh, regulations, some people practice, some people don't, and you kind of roll the dice with that. And that's where you need to be flexible and understand the level of risk that you bring in your business. Good question. One of my businesses that I started there was uh, in software IP protection. So companies that, that produce software, you know, you'd go there and basically they had, uh, get this, they had Word, you know, that you type Word, Excel, but there was a Chinese version that is exactly the same as Microsoft's, except it's got this little ribbon in there and it's constantly ads going through as you're typing, it's just trying to sell you stuff, right? So they hacked these software programs and they put their own malware and their own adware into them and they try to use, and this is the level of, of piracy that was occurring. Not only did they take the software and give it away for free, they take the software, they modify it so that they could drive revenue through it on top of that, right? So it's rampant in some, some respects. But now I think a lot of that has uh, changed because as China starts to develop its own IP, its own regulation starts to catch up and, and protect itself. So before there was not a lot of incentives, but now there's starting to be more incentives. So IP is uh, less and less of an issue, but there's still a lot of piracy. It's very hard to control. So I, I think that uh, maybe I've got a little bit of the Stockholm Syndrome having lived there for 10 years. Uh, so you start to sympathize with your captor, you know that, that saying? So, um, but I, I really think there's merit in some of the things that the Chinese are doing in terms of a state-controlled economy and state-controlled agendas. And um, when you let, when you try to grow a country so quickly and, you know, generational gaps that are so vast, you know, my father made $10 and I make $1,000. That kind of a gap in thinking is huge. And you can't do that without breaking some eggs, right? You know, it's, it's like making an omelet, right? And so there is a little bit of utilitarianism that's being applied here by Xi Jinping that, you know, if we want to benefit the whole society and bring everybody up, then people have got to give up some freedom. Everybody's got to get onto the same bus. We can't have everybody speak up their mind because it just doesn't get anything done that way. So his thinking is, given the path of growth that they've had so far, uh, there's been a little bit of relaxed control in the past, and some of the performance of the state assets have not been optimal. Right? So the, the people that they have taught in the party to go out and manage these companies They've been more bureaucrats, and they've gotten a little bit full of themselves, and not really think, thought about their responsibility to the whole country. So some of them is a, abuse of power and corruption. So Xi Jinping is saying, it's time to rein that back. Right? So he's purposely going out there and bringing that back. Two, he's thinking, 
if we let growth continue this way, a lot of it is actually funded by the people. In other words, it's artificial. You know, when the stock market was running out of control last year, the government stepped in and just basically bought out some of the, some of the losing uh, stocks and, and washed away the problems. So they don't have that ability to continue to dig into the pockets and try to fix these uh, 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 industry problems. So they need to control it more. So these controls are put in place to manage growth, to manage the people, so that it can be a little bit more stable and then allow newer growth to come. He wants to create this platform that's stable. He doesn't want this thing to continue to keep growing very rapidly and out of control. So that's why the new normal is a very, very big thing for them. So corruption is, uh, you know, it's, there is, there is clearly corruption going on in, in many of these growth markets. Uh, but when you really get down into it, some of that is really gray. So for example, if, if I make a contribution to a lobby organization, is that corruption? Maybe not. But you know, in China, they don't have lobbying organizations that same way. So it's seen as corruption. So if I have a mayor of a city that I pay uh, make payments, contributions to, to facilitate a meeting between this business and that business and get a, an incentive for a tax, for real estate, for whatever, is that, is that corrupt? So in our, in our minds, if it's not a transparent way of doing business, yes, it is corrupt. Right? But in China, they've never had this practice of transparency. So they don't, they don't have those definitions and so it, it is corrupt in that sense. And so the government will jump on that. Right? Um, I guess so, so my first response to you is we, we need to be careful what the word corrupt really means in what context. And two is, um, you know, do I see corruption in China? Yeah, I absolutely, we see that. Uh, how do I see it? You know, I, I wait in line to um, get an eye check so that I can get a driver's license. And there's this huge line. And uh, you know, there's a guy standing on the side here. He says, "Hey, did you want to get a eye check?" "Yeah, okay, ten dollars." And he walks me directly up to the head of the line and pays somebody ten dollars, and they sign off, and I'm done. Right? So I got cuts. I took I took cuts in line, right? But that's corruption, right? Because that's a government medical center, and I got somebody to sign an official document, right? They didn't even look at me. And I took that and got my driver's license. Corruption. Right? But if we had an express service, if the doctor's office had an express service that said, if you're willing to pay $10, you can come up here, you can sign this, we'll check you out, and we'll stamp it, and you're ready to go, it's no longer corrupt. It's an express lane. Right? So yeah, those are, it, it just, you have to really think through that. And it, it happens at all levels. Thank you.